Morning. Uh, it's great to be up in uh, Beverly. Uh, and uh, my name is Judah LeBlanc, and I'm here with my writer friends Randy Ross and uh, and Jason. And I'm blank. Jason, I'm blanking on your last name. All of a sudden, Ruben. Ruben. Been three years. I know. M Jason M. Ruben. M. Ruben. Yeah. Um, and so Randy and Jason are going to be uh, reading and sharing their work along with me. Uh, we're part of a group called the New England Indie Authors Collective, and uh, we're local writers uh, and playwrights. We publish in a number of different places, and uh, we write a mix of fiction, nonfiction, and memoir. So we're going to be giving you a taste of our work today. Um, so we're going to lead off with uh, Randy. Uh, Randy Ross is a Boston area writer and performer. His uh, comedic novel, God Bless Cambodia is up there, was published in 2017 by the Permanent Press, and he has performed his one-man shows around the United States and Canada and uh, Edinburgh in the UK. So uh, Randy, take it away. Great. Thanks, Judah. So uh, my book is God Bless Cambodia, and one of the key themes in the book is getting older but not necessarily wiser. <laughs> so I'm 63 years old and my book came out, yeah, my, my first novel was published a few years ago. So yeah, I'm late, I'm late bloomer. Um, so my book is about a chronically single guy who takes a trip around the world hoping to change his luck with love. So the book has two themes. One is travel, which offers learning by experience, and the other is relationships, which offer learning by suffering. So I'm going to do uh, a couple pieces from each. Uh, this first one, uh, the narrator is doing a little self-reflection. Every year I ask myself the same question. Why is a prize like me still single? Yeah. This year I turned to the internet for some answers. And the first thing I found was something called the fish theory. You see, fish are not attracted to bait that is healthy and moving smoothly through the water. Fish are attracted to bait that jump, jumps, quivers, and zigzags due to some type of distress. Apparently, I'm part fish and go for erratic, ziggy women who have moods that flop around like a mackerel on a hot sidewalk. <laughs> Over the years, I've dated so-called stable women, but I just never got hooked. In my 30s, I dated a stable woman named Karen, but after a few months, I wanted to break up. I was tired of her constant cheerfulness, which struck me as phony. And her moods, unlike mine, never zigged or zagged. But I was also tired of being alone, so I went to see my therapist, Dr. Moody. <laughs> he suggested I stick with her and sit with her discomfort. But being with Karen was like trying to see how long I could hold my breath. When she put her arm around me, I felt nothing. After sex, we had nothing to talk about. <laughs> Worse still, she was a nice person, and I felt really guilty. Every week I'd go into Moody's office, can I break up with her now? And he'd say, just give it another week. But my attraction to volatile women doesn't really explain why I'm still single. Lots of crazy people marry. Judging by the divorce rate and friends I know who have tied the knot, marriage is no barometer of mental health. <laughs> <laughs> but in my darkest hours, like those Saturday nights when I'm at the movies by myself and sitting in the handicap seat, I have to wonder, what's the matter with me? Mm -hmm. 
the valency theory. You see, certain atoms have the ability to bond with lots of different types of atoms. Other atoms are less valent and can only bond with a few types of atoms. Apparently, I'm a less valent type and can only bond with certain kooky, volatile atoms, which also seem to seek me out. When we do connect, the result is an unstable, combustible molecule that eventually... <laughs> Case in point, Ricky. I met Ricky at a barbecue in Cambridge about 10 years ago. She had straight shoulder length hair and a barbed wire tattoo around her arm. The tiny lines around her mouth indicated that she was probably about my age. Now this barbecue was in Cambridge, so it was a vegetarian, gender neutral, low carbon footprint affair. Yeah. <laughs> now I noticed Ricky because she had brought a huge bloody porterhouse. It looked like a prop for a slasher movie. <laughs> I watched as she wrestled the thing onto the grill. She glanced at me. She glanced again. I gave her my one and only pickup line. So, are you having fun? <laughs> as she talked, I looked into her eyes. It looked like she'd been laughing or crying or laughing and crying. I looked deeper still and could sense a disturbance, an electrical storm. I imagined her brain cells flashing, twitching, and jumping like heron being chased by a large carnivore. I wanted to be that carnivore. <laughs> on our first date, she showed up an hour late, wearing ray bands on an overcast day. Apologies for my tardiness, she said. I was up late last night at a Caribbean party. I was the only white person there. She had my attention. We went rollerblading. At one point, I pulled ahead of her. From behind me, I heard a loud thunk, followed by, ah, crap. Ricky had slammed into a parked car. Now I was hooked. <laughs> we bonded hard and fast, but after a few months, we hit that inevitable plateau and began arguing. Then we crossed the 50% mark with the bad times outnumbered the good ones. We made an appointment with Dr. Moody. So what seems to be the problem? He's a neat freak. He's a hypochondriac. He has the worst taste in clothes and music, and he teases me all the time. Please medicate him. <laughs> He's mentioned the teasing before. There you go. Taking his side, that's the type of patriarchal attitude that used to get women locked up in mental hospitals. I knew this was a stupid idea. After the session, I called the shrink. Should I bail on this relationship? You know I can't give advice like that. Let me rephrase. If I said I wanted to bail, would you suggest that I stick with it for another week? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Randy. Uh, that was a great tutorial on relationships. <laughs> so uh, next, I'm going to introduce Jason M. Rubin. And Jason is a professional writer and a published author who lives in Malden. He specializes in writing historical fiction. And uh, in his two segments here today, he's going to be discussing a common theme in two of his books. Uh, First, he's going to be doing a piece from his latest book, which is called Villainy Ever After, which was just published uh, in the spring of this year. So, Jason. Thank you, Judah. Can everyone hear me? Is that a microphone? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for so as, uh, as uh, what's your name again? Judah, yeah. that's right. Um, <laughs> as Judah said, uh, so I have this, this new book called Villainy Ever After, which is a collection of fairy tales told from the point of view of the villain. And I just want to tell you how that sort of, that idea sort of came about. Um, as Judah mentioned, I live in Malden and I belong to a writer's group there. And um, so every workshop period, there's, there's writing prompts that were given to just you know, exercise the writing muscle. And one time, I think this must have been late 2019, one of the prompts was to write a fairy tale from the point of view of the villain, which I thought was sort of interesting. And so I wrote um, Little Red Riding Hood from the perspective of the big bad wolf who was lying on the floor bleeding to death, you know, on, uh, in Granny's uh, forest uh, shack. 
um, you know, waiting to die, but telling his story at the end of it. And I read it to the group, and, and people seemed to like it. And then COVID hit, and I was working from home, and I had, you know, some more time on my hands, so I decided I would, I would write more of these. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to learn more about the fairy tale genre, because, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of inherently knew that I didn't want to do, like, Disney versions of fairy tales. So I started doing some research, and I found this wonderful book, and I checked a few days ago. It's actually here in the library. Uh, it's called The Classic Fairy Tales by Maria Tatar, who's a, a Harvard um, professor of, uh, of something, something <laughs> smart. Um, anyway, it has like the really, the earliest versions of, uh, of fairy tales, and I found it really interesting, and I ended up doing 13 of these fairy tales, and, and then eventually wrote this sort of core narrative that floats through and connects them all together. I want to, before I address my theme, I just want to read a little bit from the intro so you get a better sense. You know, fairy tales, they're, uh, they're not just for kids, you know. Fairies and ogres, wolves and dwarves, spells and poisons, apples and pumpkins, handsome princes and beautiful princesses, evil stepmothers and fairy godmothers, magic beans and deadly <coughs> spindles. In what other world could such wondrous oddities exist but that of fairy tales? Fairy tales come to us from all over the globe. Most were originally intended as escapist literature for adults. Though rife with scenes of murder, cannibalism, rape, and incest, eventually they were brought into the nursery and told to children with the requisite amount of sanitization. Today, fairy tales are a rite of childhood uh, through which one gains a foundation in literacy and the social capital of common experience. Uh, one of the most common settings for fairy tales is a forest. Though we consider forests to be beautiful and peaceful natural spaces, uh, today, in the days of when some of these tales were first told or written down, forests were foreboding places full of dangerous wildlife and desperate ne'er-do-wells. People got lost and met their ends under the darkness of forest canopies. Castles are also common settings. In many fairy tales, mishaps and misfortunes befall kings and queens, princes and princesses, just as surely as they complicate the already difficult lives of peasant folk. Perhaps the lesson is that fate discriminates against no one. Rarely does wealth buy rescue, and social class goes only so far with most villains. While it's true that the, th that the threat of death hangs over every fairy tale, they almost always have happy endings. The witches and stepmothers and wolves and giants get their comeuppance, and the heroes not only survive, they live happily ever after. What happens, though, when we turn fairy tales around and tell them from the perspective of the villains? They end not happily, but tragically. You see the suffering of the villain. In fact, you linger in it. The supposed hero is long gone, and we're left with a creature who is beaten and broken, dying or dead. Suddenly, the villain isn't quite as fearsome as in the original version. Tell the story from their point of view, and they almost become sympathetic. I didn't intend to make my stories that way, but that's how many of them ended up. Mortality is indeed woven into the fabric of every fairy tale, and never more so than when you flip the script. So, uh, again, as I was saying, as I read about fairy tales, their history and everything, I found that there were lots of similarities among all the classic tales. Um, as I mentioned, forests and castles are ubiquitous. Uh, there's wolves and there's stepmothers, and, uh, and Dr. Tatar gives a, an interesting uh, speculation as to why there's so many evil stepmothers in fairy tales, which I can read if, if we have time. I don't want to overstep my, uh, my slot here. Of course, there are heroes and villains, and there's lots and lots of kids. And that leads to my theme, bad parenting. You go through the table of contents in this book, and you see numerous examples of bad parenting. Little Red Riding Hood. The mom sends her into the forest alone with food, knowing that there's wild animals in the forest. Then we've got Cinderella, of course, there's a wicked stepmother there. Hansel and Gretel, they were abandoned by their parents in the forest. I don't know if you remember the story. You do remember the story. The, 
they were a uh, poor woodcutter and his wife, and the wife, incidentally, is the one who's like, we can't afford to feed the kids, let's get rid of them. The kids overhear that, and then they end up taking him into the woods. Hansel brings along some bread and leaves some crumbs behind, which the birds eat, and so they're stuck there in the forest. They come upon the house of the cannibal witch. Good job, Mom and Dad. <laughs> um, Snow White has another uh, evil stepmother, Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpelstiltskin is actually the villain in the story, but um, this girl's, uh, who's never named, um, father, trying to better his station, goes to the king and says, my daughter can spin straw into gold, when of course she couldn't. So he locks her in a, in a dungeon with a bunch of straw and, and says, you know, turn this into gold by morning or I'll cut your head off. And, uh, and that's where Rumpelstiltskin actually comes to save the day. So, um, bad dad there. Rapunzel was actually a foster mother. Uh, she took this couple's firstborn baby um, uh, out of revenge for the fact that they were stealing vegetables from her garden. And, uh, and she raised uh, Rapunzel locked in a tower. Hardly worth the vegetables, if you ask me. <laughs> and then there's the three little pigs, which, similar to Little Red Riding Hood, their mother sent them into the forest. Delicious pigs. I mean, what do you think is going to happen? So I, as I said, I have 13 stories in here, and seven of them are examples of bad parenting. But only three of them are actually the villains of the stories. The others, you know, sort of get off scot-free. I'd like to read to you uh, the story of Hansel and Gretel. And... Um, Page 35. And the, um, the thing about this book, this here book of mine, is that, as I said, there's a core narrative. Basically, I, I created this, um, this uh, complimentary story of a, of a, a man who was uh, falsely imprisoned for a murder he didn't commit for four years. And when he gets out, you know, he's worried that uh, his time in prison may have changed him. Is he still the man he thought he was? You know, does is there any sort of sort of black cloud over him now? And so he decides he's going to go uh, travel. He's going to take the money that the state pays him and and compensation for the Im improper imprisonment. And he's going to interview classic villains. You know, where he finds them and finds out what makes them tick. And hopefully, trying to draw uh, distinctions uh, between himself and and the villains, which he may or may not find. Um, so every chapter begins with sort of him setting the scene, introducing the villain, talking about the, where they are. It's actually, um, it's organized by uh, country. The first three fairy tales are from France, then there's a bunch from Germany, the Grimm brothers, England, India, and Persia. So anyway, um, so there's that third person sort of, uh, well actually it's first person, but it's uh, introductory stuff, and then he interacts, he interviews the, the, the villains. Uh, point is, I'm not going to read his part, I'm just going to read the villain's part. So everything that I'm reading here is uh, the witch from Hansel and Gretel, telling her own story. Uh, it, be, it begins with, uh, with, the, with the narrator asking why her house is covered in candy. It's a simple matter, really. If you want to eat something living, you have to trap it first, right? To bait the trap, you need to use what your prey is attracted to. For example, you might use a, ki a chicken to catch a fox, or a small fish to catch a larger fish. Fish eat other fish, you know, and no one thinks that to be strange. As for me, I like to eat children. Don't judge. People eat veal, lamb, eggs. Those are the offspring of adult animals, right? I've eaten adult humans, too, but I think children just taste better. And so to trap them, I've decorated the outside of my forest home with all manner of delicious sweets, gingerbread, candy drops, cakes, chocolate bars, sugar frosting, and the like. It tends to attract ants, but wayward children who find my house can never resist the temptation to break off a shingle and gnaw on it. The other benefit of using candy and cakes to attract children is that they're fattening. Who wants to eat a skinny kid, right? I like them nice and plump, so once I've captured a child, I continue to feed them with sugars and starches, and the occasional chicken and sausage, too, of course, until they get round and succulent. Then I cook them and eat them. Braised with turnips and foraged, foraged mushrooms is an especially good recipe, by the way. And the cycle begins again when the next child finds my cottage and starts to nibble. Now, a nice fat kid makes a week's worth of meals. 
After all, it's only myself that I need to feed, right? Besides, you'd be surprised how many children get lost in these woods, though they come to me in other ways as well. For example, there was that one day just a few weeks ago when two children, a brother and sister, came to my home. They were hungry indeed. By the time I realized they were there, they'd eaten themselves nearly sick. Hansel and Gretel, their names were. They told me they'd been abandoned by their parents, which is a hungry witch's dream. Truly, I couldn't believe my good fortune. Not one child, but two, and no parents searching for them. I could take my time and fatten them up good. Of the two, Hansel, the boy, looked to be particularly tasty morsel, so I locked him in my shed while I kept the girl around to help me with chores and whatnot. I made Gretel feed him through a round air hole in the front of the shed. He could get no exercise, so he should have plumped up all the faster, right? But each day I would ask him to stick his finger out the air hole so I could see how fat he was getting. My eyes are bad, you see, so I judged by touch. Yet whenever I pressed his finger, it was as unyielding as a chicken bone. Surely, I thought, his own sister wouldn't take the food intended for him and eat it herself. I mean, she wouldn't starve her own brother, right? I was suspicious, but also impatient and getting hungry. After a week of this, I decided I'd waited long enough. It was time to cook him. That's when the girl became a problem. I thought it was my good fortune to have an extra pair of hands, Gretel's, to help with the cooking. Lifting a fat kid in a pot of water onto the stove is not easy work. Yes, I'm a witch, but not the magic kind. I'm really just an ugly, creepy kind of witch. As a result, it takes a lot of effort to feed myself, and I rarely have help. Now, I like a good crusty bread with my braised kid, so I asked Gretel to light the oven, which she did, with kindling that I made her gather herself. She also filled the pot with water. So far, she was being reasonably compliant, right? But then I guess she figured out my intention and began moving more slowly, becoming less cooperative. I got angry and decided that rather than cook the boy and the bread at the same time, I would focus my efforts on cooking the siblings together. Hansel being so chubby, <laughs> I'd sussed out that he'd been tricking me by substituting a chicken bone for his finger. There was no room for the two of them in the pot. So instead, I tried to trick uh, Gretel into climbing into the oven. When she did, I would shut the door, and as she roasted, I would cook the boy on the stovetop. A veritable feast, right? Then she started acting dumb. I told her to lean into the oven to test if it was hot enough. She claimed she didn't know what I meant. The more I explained it, the less she seemed to understand. Finally, I had to demonstrate it myself. As I leaned my upper body into the oven, which was plenty hot, believe me, the horrid girl pushed me all the way in and closed the door. <laughs> Good for her. Hmm. <laughs> the title of this chapter, by the way, is Never Trust a Girl. Um, Though my hands and face were badly burned, uh, my heavy clothing protected the rest of my body. I managed to kick the door open and drag myself out of the oven. By then, the children were gone, along with a number of my valuables. I stewed about this for a while and then took advantage of the hot oven by baking two loaves of black bread. I guess you can't eat them all, right? Since that time, I've decided to stick to eating boys. Girls are too much trouble. And who's to say the next one might be on his way to my cottage even as we speak. So worry not about me, my friend. As long as children have the habit of wandering away, my trap will continue to snare them. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That's uh, some of the advantages of a protein-rich diet. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be doing uh, two short pieces. This is kind of about um, learning the hard way, or what I call life through trial and error. This piece is called 60 Going on 20. It was mid-afternoon on a sunny, warm September day and yet I was inside my apartment, crouching on the floor, wondering if I was losing my mind. I was lightheaded, dizzy, and felt disconnected from my own body, as if I were watching my movements in slow motion on videotape delay. Meanwhile, my heart was pounding, my mouth was dry, and I was definitely alone, wondering how I'd gotten myself into this mess. The cause of my discomfort wasn't hard to find. You see, even in my disordered frame of mind, a few hours earlier I'd left Arlington Street Church, where I sing in the choir on Sunday mornings, and headed out for a walk around the public gardens. Approaching Charles Street, I could see some kind of event 
taking place on Boston Common with lots of millennials looking like the 20 teens version of the hippies of my youth. As I crossed the street, it became obvious that I'd wandered into the hemp fest or some other celebration of marijuana in all its forms. The newly legal substance was being celebrated and promoted by merchants who offered pot in all its incarnations. One could smoke it, eat it, slather oneself in oil, or flavor their favorite variety with essential oils. Snaking through the crowd, I found the whole thing overwhelming. Too many varieties, too much jargon, and too many folks who seemed to know what they were doing. I hadn't smoked pot in over 10 years, and the only time I smoked semi-regularly was in the summer of 1977, which I spent in an internship in San Francisco. <laughs> One of my roommates worked at City Hall and bought his pot from a dealer there. And our evening entertainment often consisted of smoking some weed through Greg's small pipe, attacking a box of wheat thins, and going on a cable car ride, hanging off the running board and admiring the lights. If that sounds tame, it was, at least for me. Taking a few hits or puffs was the limit of my marijuana use. The drug simply made me drowsy and gave me the munchies. It was clear walking around the festival that marijuana has come a long way. There were lots of new style pipes, inhalers that seemed designed for vaping, another fad I don't really understand, and a tent where one could go through a brief interview and get a prescription for medical marijuana. It was a hot, humid day, and I've never been one for putting unknown substances in my body. The summer of 77 was an aberration for me, and even then I was careful not to smoke too much. But several of the merchants were selling edibles, and though I'd heard about marijuana brownies and cookies back in the day, I'd never tried them. So I stopped at one of the booths, which featured small cookies in plastic vials. They looked a bit like small macaroons. And the sketchy looking guy behind the display offered me a free sample. I took one. It was small and looked harmless enough. According to the merchant, it contained something called CBD, uh, which uh, was a different type of marijuana, which uh, wouldn't space me out. I sat around, hung out, and didn't feel anything. So I went to another booth, which featured uh, prepackaged gummies. The gummies looked like candy. But according to the 20-something man who was selling them, they, like the whole package, contained about as much marijuana as three or four joints. I did the math, not very well as it turned out, and popped one in my mouth. I walked around some more, and as I prepared to head home, I took another one. Since I only felt fatigue, the result of a poor night's sleep and nothing more. I was almost back home, driving, when the edibles hit. Evidently, they take more time to have the desired effect, or in my case, to get much more than I bargained for. Suddenly, I wasn't sure what was real and what wasn't. Once I crawled up to my fourth floor walk-up appointment apartment, did I really call my friend Bill, explaining that I had mixed two different types of marijuana, ingesting way too much THC and might need to go to the hospital? Or had I imagined the whole thing? One minute felt like an hour, and I wondered if I'd had a psychotic break. I remember hearing back in the day that marijuana could make you paranoid, but now I was experiencing paranoia firsthand, my bad trip courtesy of those gummy bears. I called Bill three times, as he assured me that I wasn't cracking up, wasn't going to die, and would get through this. Once he arrived 15 minutes later, he took me for a short walk around the neighborhood. I don't remember much other than lying down on the tree lawn of a nearby building and then somehow getting back to my apartment where, after several more hours, I came back to myself. In the interim, my friend read the package explaining that I'd taken, quote, a really high dose something I'd already figured out by my body's reaction and my mind's distortion. By the next morning, I was no longer high, but I wasted two more days <coughs> in bed as I slowly tried to regain my energy and some sense of balance while recovering from my trip. 
Now, looking back on the whole experience, I'm surprised, almost shocked by my naivete. I'm a 60-year-old man making the rookie mistakes I could and perhaps should have made when I was in my 20s. Still, a week later I could say I, I emerged relatively unscathed and that recreational marijuana will not be part of my golden years. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to be doing a second round of readings and uh, Randy is going to kick it off with a few stories from his worldwide trip. <coughs> When I was 48, I got laid off from my job, and I took my severance and took a four-month solo trip around the world, and had a rotten, horrible, miserable time. Um, and actually, that became the basis for my novel, which I <laughs> embellished quite a bit and added a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm going to do a couple pieces uh, from the travel set with the travel theme. Again, these are from my novel. The first one is called "One Day in Thailand." <laughs> Bangkok. The name alone sounds a little skeevy. And from the moment I get off the plane, I'm on high alert. I've read about the deep fried tarantulas, tuk tuk scammers, and locals that play volleyball with their feet. The decor in the airport doesn't help either. Smirking Buddhas, sneering Buddhas, a gang of Buddhas pummeling a three headed snake. The airport bus drops me downtown on Sukhumvit Road. That's a boulevard that's supposed to be two blocks from my hotel. On the corner stands a local woman. She's wearing a t-shirt that says, University of Nebraska. That's Nebraska with just one P. <laughs> the whole area is peppered with these little carts selling noodles and soup. I start to walk in the sooty, humid air, stings like a lung full of red ants. Immediately, I'm lost. So I approach a guy. He's got a mossy, blonde beard growing down his sternum. He's wearing a fishing vest and shorts and the chin strap on his wide-brimmed hat is pulled snug against his jowls. Looks like he's bracing for a typhoon. <laughs> Excuse me, I ask, do you know how to get to a street called Soy 38? You from the US? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I'm from Boston. Yeah, I'm from Texas. I was an MP back in Saigon. One of the last guys out. Last guys out. <laughs> uh, wow, um, do you know, is it okay to eat any of these food carts around here? Oh, uh, you don't want to eat around here. Soy, cowboys, just a few subway stops. Subway stops. This whole Sukhumvit area is built on a swamp. I'm going to retire here. Retire here. Next, he exhales into his hand and sniffs his breath. In less than two minutes, this guy has confirmed my worst fears about Southeast Asia. This place can do things to you. Permanent, mind warping things. I put on my hat tighten my chin strap, and walk away. Walk away. <laughs> this next piece takes place in Australia. Anybody ever been to Australia? Okay. After dropping my bags at Melbourne's Wooloo Inn, a West Western knockoff near the center of town, oh, right. I amble down Swanston Street to the waterfront, the Yarra River, taking in the Aussie scene. A fly lands on my lip. I swat it away. Crossing Bork Street, I spot the stone facade and copper dome of Melbourne's historic Flinders Street train station. Another fly, another swat. A woman in a suit exits the train station and waves. A girl on a cell phone waves. A guy on a skateboard waves. Do I know these people? Something tunnels in my nose. Something skitters in my underwear. I look down and flies are collecting on me as if I were a rotting carcass. I join everyone around me, cursing, waving, and swatting. I flee down Flinders Street and duck into the Melbourne Aquarium. Feeding time begins in 15 minutes. Then I notice the price, $20. Outside, the flies are feeding. I, I, I run bobbing and weaving past a movie theater advertising a Mel Gibson flick. I'm Jewish. We don't pay retail for Mel Gibson movies. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the hotel, I confront the desk clerk as if she were somehow to blame. Hey, what's with the flies? I thought Australia was a civilized, developed country. She says nothing and hands me a pamphlet entitled, The Australian 
bush fly. <laughs> From October through January, bush flies are common in Melbourne. Bush flies feed on human tears, sweat, saliva, and mucus. Bush flies do not bite or sting. They lay their eggs in animal dung, not on humans. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Suggestion, wear a hat with a mesh net that covers the face. A sign behind the desk clerk advertises mesh net hats for $35. <laughs> I don't pay retail for hats with logos on them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Uh, I went to Australia, but fortunately I was at uh, Melbourne in the, uh, in the off season, the fly off season. Fly off season. Uh, so next, Jason is going to be continuing with his theme of bad parenting. He's uh, sharing some pieces from his book, Ancient Tales Newly Told, which was published in 2019. When I say bad parenting, of course, present company accepted. <laughs> Just trying to pass a Monday morning. Um, so uh, yes, I have this book, Ancient, oh, sorry, Ancient Tales Newly Told. It contains two short novels, uh, both uh, historical fiction. And I'm going to uh, talk about the, uh, the more recent of the, of the two, which is called King of Kings. And it's about the uh, meeting and romance between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, told primarily from the Ethiopian tradition. What is the Ethiopian tradition? One day, I was listening to a CD by the jazz singer Cassandra Wilson, and there's a song on it called Solomon Sang. And I could tell by the lyrics that she was singing about King Solomon. But there's a line that says, uh, but when he, and when he lay down with Makeda, Solomon sang. And, you know, I went to uh, Sunday school. I never uh, heard of the name Makeda associated with Solomon or at all. Uh, so I Googled it and found that Makeda is the Ethiopian name for the Queen of Sheba. And, um, and it, their story is uh, integral to this uh, historical theological book that the Ethiopians have called the Kebra Nagast, which means the glory of kings. And it turns out that unlike the uh, story in the Bible, which is in the first book of Kings and takes up all of 13 uh, verses in which the Queen of Sheba hears about the wisdom of Solomon, is intrigued, goes to Israel, asks him difficult questions, delights in his answers, and leaves with some parting gifts. In the Ethiopian tradition, she goes there, stays for six months. Solomon, say, non-consensually impregnates her. Uh, it wasn't totally a rape, but it was pretty rapey. Um, and she goes home and gives birth to a son named Menelik. And as it turns out, that Ethiopian rulers right into the 20th century with Haile Selassie trace their lineage back to the fruit <coughs> of the union between Solomon and Makeda. And I thought, well, that's a whole lot more interesting than the stuff I learned in Temple. <laughs> so I thought I would research that and, um, and, and write a book about it. Um, now the interesting thing about Menelik, of, of which not a lot is known, is that you know, his father is the king of Israel, his mother is the queen of Sheba. He can inherit either of two thrones. And you know, it's also that each parent wants him naturally to inherit theirs. You know, Solomon's still in, in uh, uh, Israel and, and Makeda is still in uh, Sheba. So, you know, they're not together. And it's like each one wants Solomon and wants uh, Menelik to be with them. Now, these are the smartest people in the world at this time, Solomon and Makeda. So it's not like they're being devious or talking smack about the other parent. But it's clear that they are, you know, putting a little bit of pressure on him. And so I want to read uh, two scenes that, uh, that describe that. The first one is with uh, his mother. So at the age of 22, Menelik decides to go back to Israel to meet his father for the first time. And this is that, um, this is that uh, discussion. I knew this day would come, my son, said Makeda, with lips that were dry and eyes that were wet. 
Yet still I feared it. I was not sure I could bear to face the moment, and now it has come to be. She turned away from Menelik, but quickly turned back. She did not want to give the impression that she was refusing his request. She just needed time to compose herself and her reply. With so long to prepare for this, I find myself feeling quite unprepared. So what am I to say? What do I tell my beloved son on this bittersweet day? All I ask is your blessing, replied Menelik. He was 22 years of age now, a man. It was time and he was ready, ready at last to sail to Jerusalem, to, to sail to Israel, to enter Jerusalem, to meet King Solomon, his father. He was a man now. He didn't need his mother's permission, yet that is precisely what he sought. My blessing you have, my son. But then, what is left for me? I don't understand. It was ten years ago that you asked me the name of your father. I knew that day would come as well, but it was different. I had no intention of denying you the truth once you had acknowledged your need to know the truth. And I told you proudly that King Solomon, the wisest and fairest man in the world, was your father, and that he favored me to provide for him an heir, and that you grew in the soil of my deep love for Solomon, whose teachings were so important to me. I always hoped that you would emulate him when you became a man, and you have. I am honored that you think so, mother. Yes, in many ways you are his exact image, handsome, sensitive, compassionate, creative. Not as wise, of course, but no one is. How I wish I could tell you all you ever wanted to know about your father, and, and, yes, Menelik softly asked so as to gently break the pause in his mother's halting, haunted speech, and still keep you near me. Menelik looked down. He had feared it would come to this. I am not leaving you forever, mother. I'm sure he didn't say it quite like that, but. <laughs> perhaps not, but perhaps you are. I know what it is like to ride into Jerusalem and see the magnificence of his kingdom, the magnificence of Solomon himself. I knew you would one day want to visit him, and I knew that I would have to let you. Mother, and I knew that if you went there, tempted by Solomon's wisdom, the majesty of the land, and the promise of his throne, you might never return. Mother, I promise you that I will return. If you like, you may send old Tamron with me to enforce this vow I make to you. Tamron was a traitor who went to Israel first. That is an excellent idea, Menelik. Perhaps you are wiser than I had allowed. The two shared a smile. But no, I must trust you and allow you this journey, this journey not of miles, but of years. It is important that you know from whom, where and from whom you come. You must go to Solomon. So he goes to Israel, and he's hanging out with Solomon, and they're spending days together, and he's showing Menelik everything. And, um, and then it comes to time for their little talk. Um, okay, so they're having dinner together. Only near the end of their meal did Solomon speak. We have said little this meal, my son, but we have thought much. Do you agree? Yes, I suppose so, Menelik responded. You suppose so? Why do you suppose so? I just mean that you must be correct. But why must I be correct? I asked if you agreed with me. Therefore, I did not assume that I was correct. I know for certain what I think. I want to know what you think, my son. I think you are correct, said Menelik, somewhat louder than he had intended. Must I mine for your words as if they were encased in rock, Menelik? I don't know what you want me to say, father. Menelik was testing the word to see how it fit like a newly woven sandal. I want to know your thoughts, that is all. I simply want to know what you are thinking. I know that, but I am not sure of my thoughts. I have many thoughts, but they fight each other in my mind. They must lead somewhere, I know, but as of this moment, I know not where. That is good, Menelik. That is the sign of a healthy mind. Knowledge does not flow like milk from a teat. Sorry to get dirty with you, but... Um, it is the result of digging, sifting, examining, evaluating, until finally you see if what you have been knocking around in your head is a jewel or just a stone. I fear what I have is a stone. From stones, the temple to the Lord was built. Hide no more from me. Tell me what is behind your silence. Menelik paused. Why must I always summon courage to speak with my parents, he wondered. I have enjoyed my visit here. I have enjoyed meeting you. Having briefly gotten to know you, I am deeply honored to be your son. Truly I am, but I am also conscious of the fact that your land is not the land of my birth. You wish to return to see Sheba. If it were as simple as that, I would not be troubled in my mind. You are torn then. I understand. You have been raised in Sheba at your mother's side. You are heir to the throne of all Ethiopia. You would rule over people you understand, over a land whose soil is in your skin, whose air has filled your nose since the days you were born. 
Who would not envy being in that position? Solomon rose and continued to speak. And yet you are my flesh and blood too. You are the son of a king, the king of a united Israel. Your feet may feel as strangers here, but this land of milk and honey that was promised to God by God to Abraham our forebear is in the blood that pulses within your heart. You are no alien here, Menelik. The history of the Israelite people is your history as well. This land is yours, these people are yours, and this, Solomon waved in all directions, all of this is yours. The throne, the kingdom, the temple, all has been promised to you from the moment of your birth. It has all been waiting for you. I have been waiting for you to give this all to you. Menelik was without speech. He stared down at the table, not daring to make contact with his father's eyes. This is your conundrum, Menelik, is it not? Your mother and I each have a throne to offer you, but you can sit in only one. Whichever throne you choose, you will disappoint the parent holding the other. You may wish to have both, you may wish to have neither, but only one you will have, and the time for your decision is soon at hand. I know, Father, Menelik said at last, it is exactly as you say. What I have seen in Jerusalem in my short time here is beyond anything I have ever imagined could be possible in this world. It is magical. But my mother, yes, said Solomon, your mother, not your mother's throne, but your mother. It is hard to leave one's mother, quite difficult at birth and nigh impossible thereafter. Thank you, Jason. Yes, it can be hard to leave one's mother, or sometimes it can come as a relief. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do a piece which is basically the heart of my book, Echoes of Jerry. Um, and uh, it's a little, the book is kind of about uh, the story of, my, of growing up with my uncle who was deaf. He was an oral deaf man. And, uh, and my experience of uh, knowing him in some ways and not knowing him in some ways. Uh, and then I went on to work in the deaf community for about 15 years, and then I lost some of my own hearing. So this is a story of that. One morning, 15 years ago, at the end of a long winter, I answered the phone and had to switch the receiver to my right ear. My left felt plugged up as if I were on a plane. Weeks and then months went by while I waited for things to return to normal, which they never did. So eventually I made an appointment with an ear, nose, and throat doctor who gave me a hearing test. Sitting in a soundproof booth, I raised my hands in response to a series of beeping tones. But there were long periods of silence while I strained to catch those faint beeps. Now, the irony of all this was not lost on me. You see, 25 years earlier, I earned my undergrad degree in deaf education. I taught deaf children and later worked as a sign language interpreter. As a boy, I felt a deep connection with my Uncle Jerry, who was born deaf. Now I realize it was because we were both different, Jerry visibly, while I felt like an outsider on the inside. You see, growing up gay, I carried secrets, but unlike my uncle, I could almost pass for normal. As a boy, I looked up to Jerry, who was full of stories about his experiences being the only deaf kid on the Cleveland Heights High School basketball team. I played guard, earned my varsity letter, only deaf kid in the whole league. But at home, Jerry's father, my grandfather, who we called Papa Ben, spoke to my uncle, who was by then almost 40 years old, as if he were a boy. How many times have I told you? We've been over all this before. Why do I have to explain everything to you over and over again? Years later, I realized that my Uncle Jerry did miss a lot of what my grandfather said. You see, Papa wore a mustache, which made lip reading almost impossible. And lip reading is hard anyway. I understood, too, my grandfather's frustration in having a handicapped son who would never be the boy or man Papa really wanted. Now, when I was a senior in high school, I visited some classes for deaf kids and saw for the first time little boys and girls signing, their fingers flying, much too fast for me to follow. 
Still, I was transfixed by the visual dance and wanted to learn their secret language. But I never saw my Uncle Jerry sign. By then, he was married to his second wife, a volatile, dark-haired hearing woman who looked a lot like his first wife, who was deaf. But even with his first wife, who signed, my uncle didn't, sometimes holding his own hands, restraining himself, as his teachers had done years earlier. You see, Jerry's oral method teachers taught him that sign wasn't a language, but a series of crass, animal-like gestures unfit for human consumption. Jerry used his voice instead, but his speech was harsh and dissonant. By then, he was working as a draftman's assistant, limited by the education he'd received from those same teachers who taught him to speak, but little else. I'm not sure if I told him about my plans to teach deaf kids, but a few months later, just before I graduated from high school, Jerry died of a heart attack at 44. So all those years later in the specialist's office, I looked over at my audiogram and knew that something was seriously wrong. The doctor didn't seem too concerned. Dr. Blase said I probably had uh, an inner ear virus. If you come in sooner, we would uh, fit, uh, we'd give you steroids, but now it's too late. I'll come back in a year and we'll fit you with a hearing aid. I walked out of his office feeling dizzy, ungrounded. I went to a second doctor. That doctor said he, that he thought one of the tiny bones in my middle ear had stopped working. Surgery might ease the problem, but I'd never have normal hearing, so I chose the least invasive option, a hearing aid. I made frequent trips to the audiologist, a honey-voiced southern blonde who fit me with one hearing aid, then a second, and then a third. The first two fit in my ear and were almost invisible, but in crowded spaces, they would wail, which frustrated me. So eventually, I gave in and got a behind-the-ear aid with a visible coil a symbol of the aging process. Uh, still, it took getting used to. I removed it in the rain with wind at the gym. As the audiologist told me on one visit, not a day will go by when you don't think about your hearing for the rest of your life. It turns out she was right. I worried about batteries, earwax, and losing the aid on a daily basis. I went into movies and crowded restaurants and strained to catch what I couldn't quite hear. And I thought of Jerry when I, as a boy who couldn't quite fit in, watched my uncle try to satisfy my grandfather, try to be normal, try to be like a hearing person, but he couldn't do it any more than I, as a boy, could give up my fantasies of the high school jocks and their lean athletic bodies. You see, Jerry was my uncle and his deafness was part of him, like his big hands and long fingers which lifted me up into the air when I was a boy and squeezed a bit too hard as if to convey the connection between us, which was unspoken because I was just a boy and Jerry couldn't express his feelings through the strange puzzle of English. I remember one night in the fall of 1974, my brother Alex had his bar mitzvah, followed by a party for family and friends with dinner and a band. I knew that Jerry loved to dance. He could feel the rhythm pulse through his size 13 shoes. And on this night, as he guided his second wife to the dance floor, my uncle was radiant. They danced together, hips rocking side to side, fingers snapping, my uncle's black shoes shining. And as the band launched into Aretha's R-E-S-P-E-C-T, taking care of TCB, my uncle was with them getting down, rocking out, and no one could tell him that he was not whole, not full, not right for this one night. Six months later, he was dead. Today, I think of Jerry, the price he paid for being different. And the echoes between my life and his, which continue today, 35 years after his death. Thank you. Thank you. So that's basically the basis for my book. Um, and that's pretty much our presentation in terms of our formal thing. So thank you so much. You, could, you guys can applaud, it's okay. <laughs> Jason, Randy, and me, we'll take it.
Um, usually when we do a presentation, we also kind of open it up for a little bit of Q&A. If you have any questions, if you want to know something about, you know, Jason's life as a novelist or Randy's experiences in his, his performances and round the world tour uh, or my experiences as a writer and storyteller, um, you know, you can talk to us informally, but does anybody have any questions? Yeah. I'd like to know, like, you, you uh, rehearse, practice, get ready on your own, and then you rehearse together? Uh, how does it work? That's um, yeah, some, I mean, sometimes we re rehearse together, and sometimes we do it separately. Um, I mean, we've, we've performed together numerous times. Yeah, it kind of depends on the gig. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How did you find each other? Yeah, that's great. Actually, uh, you and I met at Grub Street, I think. Uh, Randy and I actually met through a mutual <coughs> friend uh, who we, we all had some connection to the Cambridge Center for Adult Ed and, uh, and then Jason kind of found us I think through our website? Uh, no, it was, um, there, well there was, there was an event that they were doing There was an event that they were doing <laughs> at uh, a Winchester uh, bookshop and I happened to be just strolling browsing and I saw a sign for it but the event was on my birthday, so I didn't go. But afterwards, I thought, well, I am an independent author, so maybe I should be part of this uh, illustrious collective. And uh, fortunately, there were very few membership requirements, uh, no annual dues. And, uh, and so we've been doing this, yes, for a few years now. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, any, uh, any maybe, yeah. Uh, what does the, uh, the group that you belong to in, for independent authors, what does that, do, what does it offer you as a writer? Um, yeah, the, I, I think really it offers us, my take on it is uh, kind of mutual support because, you know, writing itself is really pretty isolating. And so um, we, it gives us a chance to talk about our work with each other and then we also uh, work with each other to find opportunities like this where we can, you know, share our work, which you know, as I think as writers, and certainly uh, for me as a storyteller, it's about communication. So looking for opportunities to kind of get our work out there one way or another is, for me, it's kind of why, I think it's why we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What are some of the other places you've gone and given this talk? A lot. A lot of live, a lot four. of four. Just, just four. Just four? Uh, yeah. What, Medford, Plymouth? <laughs> I mean, these are all libraries. Oh, all, all, right. yeah, there's libraries, but individually, actually, Judah and I have uh, separate one-man shows. So we've done them at this, this is a circuit of amateur theater festivals, and they're called fringe theater festivals, and they're all around the U.S. and Canada. Oh, wow. Holy so, Christmas! So we've yeah, Judah and I have done that. And actually, you, you've done <laughs> lectures and readings, and different things. Yeah, we did a uh, we did. Where was the temple that we did the thing for? We all happen to be Jewish, so we came up with the idea of doing a thing called Jews and Their Muses, where we talked about like That's good. Jewish, you know, people who inspired us. We did that for a temple. Which where was the temple? It was in Newburyport. Yeah, in Newburyport Newbury Newbury or something. Yeah. So My Rod heroes, by the way, were Bob Dylan and the Three Stooges. <laughs> Mine were Rodney Dangerfield and the Three Stooges. <laughs> Yeah, I like the Three Stooges. But I, don't, I don't say they were my muse, but uh, but yeah, Randy and I have done a number of large theater festivals, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, including uh, like Winnipeg and Edmonton, uh, wow. Calgary and Canada, wow. Chicago, and, and then uh, you, yeah, we both did. Chicago. We did both in Chicago. I did uh, Minneapolis. I just was in Cleveland, which is my hometown. In July, they have a small festival. But Randy, you're the only one from Endicott College, is that right? It's on Judah. I'm from, I worked at Endicott. I don't work there right now. But I know that. There. You yeah, I used to work at Endicott, but yeah. I, mean, I, like Endicott. I like Endicott College. Yeah, it's a, it's a, they got a nice campus. I like Jewish people too. All right. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, it's gentlemen. Who was, when you were all reading or, or, or presenting what you what you had written, do you speak your words out loud when you are writing to see if it sounds right? I tend to do, I tend to almost hear it in my head because like yesterday I did that piece, the last piece I did uh, is a piece from my one man show which is called It's Now or Never, My Life in the Late Middle Ages. And, um, and so yes, I definitely work 
to uh, kind of physicalize and embody my pieces. And when I'm writing something, I tend to almost hear it in my head be, and, and it has a certain rhythm. So yes, I would say for me, I do. Actually, um, so the stuff I was doing were scenes out of my book, but I've reworked them because you know, a lot of stuff, me, you, you know, a scene, you need to have a beginning, middle, and end, so they need to be tweaked. Um, I've also worked with a theater director. So, uh, I mean, normally I, I have more props than this for my show. But yeah, I mean, those, actually those drawings he did. So uh, when I'm writing, I don't actually uh, read it out loud to myself, but when I'm, you know, for any of my performance pieces, I'll rehearse them, I'll rehearse them with the director. So, so I'm forgetting names now, but who's the author and, and performer who wrote Swimming to Cambodia? Oh, uh, Spalding Gray. Spalding Gray, Spalding Gray. Yeah. 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 Some of what you were all doing gave me that feeling. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's also a guy named John Leguizamo. <clears throat> who does uh, like one man shows, he's an actor and a writer. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think what Randy and I do in performance is kind of like our version of that. Yeah, it's that minimalness, right? You don't need actor, you don't need a stage, all you need is a place to stand or a place to sit and talk. It's yeah, I mean, when we have- It's very compelling to hold an audience like that. It's hard, yeah. It ain't easy, yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. add, can I just add something? Yeah, yeah, sure. When you're writing, your brain knows what you want to say and how you want to say it and sort of assumes that your fingers are going on for the ride. And when you like take a step back and sort of reread it, well, that wasn't exactly what I thought I was saying. And at that point, it's, it's a good time to like read it out loud and see if it, see if it, it feels right. Um, because you know, sometimes your, your brain plays tricks on you when you're writing. It's like, I, yeah, I know what you want to say. I know what you want to say, but it doesn't always get down there. And even when I'm reading, from it, sometimes I'll read something, I'm like, why did I say it like that? <laughs> you know, now that I'm reading it, I'm like, it would be so much easier if I chopped out a word or two. Yeah, and, I, and one thing I would add to that is, um, sometimes something will work well on the page, but if you're going to take it, for, especially for performance, uh, there's like another level of editing that I do sometimes if I'm gonna take it off the page because something can actually read and be fine, mm -hmm. but if you're gonna do it for performance, say, then sometimes uh, we have to be, I don't know, adjust it a little bit. So maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah. And this one's for Randy. Did you really hate your four, that four months of travel? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, large portions of it I did. I mean, I, I'd never taken a long trip like that. Um, and a lot of times, you don't know if you're configured to take a four month solo trip until you actually do it. So I, I mean, after two weeks, I was ready to come home, but I'd already bragged to everybody, oh, I got laid off, I don't care, I'm taking a trip around the world, I'll be fine. So I couldn't come back. <laughs> yeah. You said that you taught sign language. Did you ever work at the Beverly uh, School of Deaf? I didn't work at, Be at Beverly School for the Deaf. They do yeah, and, well, they did a form of what they call signed English, um, and I and I used more like American Sign Language. Yeah. But um, I did. Uh, I taught in Ohio. I worked at the Ohio School for the Deaf in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Then I worked for about a year south of Boston. Um, I took and then I trained to become a sign language interpreter. I took courses at Northeastern. Uh, and then I did freelance interpreting at a number of different colleges, including BU, UMass Boston, Northeastern. But I only did it for, I taught for about eight years. I burned out. I took a break from working with deaf people for about seven years. I went back. I trained to become an interpreter. I did it for about three years. I burned out again. And so writing the book for me was a way of kind of connecting with deaf people, but not really working in that world. If you're interested in that world, I'd say check out the book. And I will say that Jason and Randy and I all have our books up here, so you know you're welcome to you know take a look. Um, I've read them, and I think they're all good. But anyways, we got a little taste of them today. So anyways, thank you so much. Thank you to Ona and the Beverly Public Library and the Friends of the Public Library for having us.